of owning a cafe and other heroic deeds by Beware the Tristado, Chapter 78, All Might Our Land, Part 2. Enjoying the feeling of the wind rushing through his hair, Dobby allowed himself to sigh. His body sat between a blinking, oddly fascinated tumbra and extended photo-taking spinner. They'd all promised not to leak any of the images they took today online. However, since meeting Shoda, getting a family, and actually taking photographs, he was glad that they'd been allowed to take some. It was memories like these he thought that were worth keeping and looking back on. So, where do you guys want to start? Blinking out of his thoughts, the flame quirk user regarded the green-skinned Dean, his expression a little bashful. Oh, uh, I... I've never been here before. He admitted his dun jeepish. Where would you say he's best? He asked, the sounds of the kids giggling, shouting, and generally enjoying themselves as the staff continued to drive them towards an entrance the public didn't usually use, flitting all around them. You... you've never been here? Spinner repeated slowly, his face a mixture of shag and horror. But... but this is all my old land. The guy gives away tickets to every elementary school. I... Ah, uh, you know what? I'm shutting up and shutting up now. He stated his features changing as his understanding bloomed. All I will say is that I'll make sure you have the best time, okay? This is one of my favorite places, hands down, and I swear as your friend, we'll make up for your old family not having brought you here. He stated, his arms folded whilst he nodded sagely. Um, thanks, man. He smiled, their shoulders nudging. You've not visited this place either, right? He asked his partner, those crimson eyes shimmering as they drove past a range of storage units, old sets from the shows that performed every half an hour, and groups of smiling workers. They were no doubt thrilled to have only a handful of people to look after in this heat for a change. Ah, since they didn't see a theme park is a great place for gaining meaningful reconnaissance. The palest of the three chuckled blithely, his body leaning into his. I always wanted to come, though, you know? My... My dad was against the whole idea of this place, so when my elementary school got to go, I had to stay home. He sighed, bringing his partner closer to him. Dobby allowed his turquoise eyes to cast over the park's high walls and the trees with red tracks, spiraling, looping, and twirling above it. You guys, shit, well, well, look, you're here now, right? Their future-haired friend tried, his tone conflicted as he struggled with how to comfort them. Yeah, yeah, we are. He smiled back at him, his other arm moving so that his hand could pat the other's shoulder affectionately. And we've got the best guide, too, by the sense of it, all right? Whooping as the golf buggy turned around one final corner, he and his friends waved enthusiastically at... Oh, my Hello, boys! Are you ready to have some fun? Grinning madly, the three of them, his mother and kaminari san hopping off of the little number one pro face-fronted vehicle alongside Takeo, Tadeo, and Seiji, who were just as cool as Shoni... Grinning madly, the three of them, his mother and Kamanari-san, hopped off of the little number one pro face-fronted vehicle alongside Takeo, Tadeo, and Seiji, who were just as cool as Shoni, to approach the man who was treating them. What? This place is so cool! I can't believe that we have an honor ourselves! Thank you, sir! He told them his face beaming as the man actually ruffled his hair whilst his squad similarly popped up their praises. You're very welcome, Katsuki Coat, and ah, it looks as though everyone's made it. Hey, hi, how are you? He grinned whilst moving to greet the other, laughing, cheering, and energetically enthused people now jumping, leaping, and floating off in the buggies. Watching him go, the crimson eyed boy then looked to the park itself, his excitement mounting. He could already see the many, many rides he was just about tall enough to enjoy. He wasn't stupid. He knew that they'd still have to follow safety procedures, but that was one of the best things about All Might Land. When they built it, the pro had insisted that the majority of the rides be made for children because what's the point of having a theme park for everyone to enjoy when most of the bigger, faster attractions are made primarily for adults? I say it's time that we made the experience of such places as all-inclusive as possible and never want to go back on my word. That's what All Might Land will be. <laughs> it was great to see a grown up with that kind of power and slay considering the needs of younger people, wasn't it? Okay then, my friends. Turning back to their symbol of peace, all of them paying attention regardless of their desires to run off to enjoy themselves. Katsuki threw his arms around Danky and Eiji's shoulders, all three of them bouncing. 
All of the attractions are open, and there are hydration stations available too. Check your line your tags as they'll direct you to the nearest one or any other facilities you might need. And, oh, let's say we meet at picnic area 6 at 1400 for lunch. All right. Watching the group disperse, Shota let out a pleased sigh as his eyes alighted on each of the people he cared about deeply, wandering into the brightly lit, cheerful, music-filled space, peppered with bubble guns, jetting out the shimmering spheres to give the whole area a magical, whimsical feel. The youngest teens were heading to the Plus Ultra Zone, whilst Mitsuki, Inko, and Koji were excitedly chattering behind the study group who were running full tilt towards American states of smash country, as Seiji, Takeo, and Tadeo jogged straight ahead to Western River Rapids World, towels in hand. Still stood at the entrance with Toshinori and the local pros, the eatery owner grinned at him. So, where should we start? Well, oh yeah. Nimori replied, her brows waggling. I'm going to check out Stars and Stripes Town because my Temujan on Super Surprises before we hit the rides. She added, her arms looped around the older woman's shoulders, her lips landing a quick peck on her piggy cheeks. But you know what? Since this is your first time here, I think it'll be a great idea for Toshi Senpai to show you around it. Oh, what you know? She gushed, the others gasping behind her. Is that the world famous Big Star Paris land? She pushed whilst blinking owlishly and pointing at it dramatically. I bet you'd be able to see the whole park from the top of there, wouldn't you? Hmm? She snickered, the other pros nodding enthusiastically. Laughs learning, Shota turned his gaze toward the number one bro and nodded his head ruefully. Come on then. He jumped. But after that, I want you to take me to the fastest roller coaster you've got, okay? Ah! Yes, yes, of course, the bronzed hero offered his smile wide as they waved at the others and marked off down a very brightly colored red, white, and blue brick road surrounded by lush, clearly well-look-after bushes, speckled with signs featuring the many walk besides offering facts, safety tips, and rules. If the big dope thought he was being inconspicuous when he made two very obvious thumbs-up signs behind his head at the tittering people whom he was certain had set up this whole arrangement that he definitely needed to check his status as a master strategist, didn't he? He was such a ham, but an adorable one, wasn't he? It wasn't often that Yagi Toshinori felt like skipping. However, as he and Shoda walked towards the Ferris wheel together, he was... Tempted. Baseball card collecting. Really? Did you ever play the sport yourself? Their conversations were easy, both of them relaxed, and the eatery owner never once raised issues to do with his fame, wealth, status, or property portfolio. No, their talks just revolved around normal everyday things. Uh, my, uh, court came in late, and I, um, struggled to control it initially, so... Even though I did try my best to play ball when I was younger, I have to admit that I wasn't exactly um, athletic as a boy. Things that, outside of Marai, who was always so busy, and Nezu, busier still, he rarely got to talk about. Well, if if it wouldn't be too much trouble, would you mind mentioning that to Naoki? He may seem really confident on the outside, and he's grown so much, both in terms of his mental health and abilities, but when I met him for the first time, he was a five-year-old boy trapped in his skin. He, he has had to live through a lot. And in return, he got to learn more about the man, and with every passing word, every shared memory, every piece of the puzzle which made up Aizawa showed up, given to him, he felt himself becoming more and more smitten. I would be delighted to speak with him, he said as they boarded one of the red, white, and blue capsules, the seriousness of the request not diminishing even when his delight spiked at the younger male choosing to sit beside him in the circular seated pod. He is a remarkable young man, he furthered kindly as one of the staff closed the gate and waved them off. And I hope you'll forgive me for saying this, Shotokun, for as greatly saddened as I am to all the hardships you faced growing up, I, I cannot help but feel grateful that he and your other brothers... Came to you when the dead. He said his smile softened by remorse and admiration. You inspire me. I, as a child to aspiring to be a hero, well, I always dreamed of making a difference on a grand scale. But now, having met you and seen what you've done, I cannot help but think that tackling the problems on the ground and branching out from there would have been better. 
he admitted, his eyes cast over Musatafu and beyond. Maybe if he just sat down and thought about the problem, instead of filling his heads with such lofty ideas, then maybe he would have had more of an impact. Because by thinking that what the people needed, what they wanted, was a symbol, well, didn't that predominantly affect the good people? Didn't he embody the hope that he'd save them? But save them from whom? Perhaps by holding himself up as a bastion for others to follow, he may have inadvertently made things worse for the people without a Hollywood smile, traditional human features, muscles, and virtually unlimited physical power. Worse, because not everyone could look this way. Not everyone had what were deemed to be useful or special powers. And the more he thought about it, who could argue with Shota's perspective? Stopping people from becoming villains, in many instances, through care, help, compassion, and support, was certainly better than stopping them once they'd started committing crimes, wasn't it? It's not too late, you know. Blinking, his eyes turning back to the man. Toshinori felt his heart skip a beat or two when a warm, hard-working hand rested atop his own. In fact, now is as good a time as any, isn't it? The other smiled. Oh, he could drown in that expression. And it's not for me or anyone else to tell you what to do with your wealth or your time. And God knows you must be busy, but... The continued, his features sincere. Having become a symbol now, that means you have sway over the media and to some extent the government, right? So why not look into the differences you can make on a smaller scale? He asked. You can help to set up scholarships, community centers, and extracurricular programs for all of those bored teenagers roaming around. You could join up with charities that work with single parents and people from disadvantaged backgrounds. But word to the wise. He said that smile gurking. Ah, he, he never seen Shota smirk before. It, it looked good on him. Uh-huh. Don't go trying to muscle in on the cafe business in my area, okay? I'd hate to have to give you my patented cat that special, you know. He quipped, his right brow arching wryly, laughing heartily, his eyes alight with mirth. Toshinori found his hand lacing with the other man's. Oh, you don't think that I'd do it, huh? Oh. God, he... He not felt this light in years! Oh, no, no, Shotoku, I'm sure that you... I don't that you would, he replied, the younger now juggling along with him. He could stay on this Ferris wheel with him forever, he was sure of it. Walking at a more sedate pace, Inko found herself more than content to sidle one of her dearest friends, both of them wafting at their faces with all my toe hand fans that a very lovely young man had given them at the hydration station they passed. Nah, it's been a while since you and I got to spend some quality time together, hasn't it? Blinking, her eyes had been marveling at the spirally track overhead. The slightly younger woman regarded her usually boisterous friend to find her looking uh, a little subdued. I, I was just thinking about it, you know, she furthered, her smile dimming. I was having Shodakun as an example, seeing the impact he's had on Katsuki, my Katsuki, the kid who used to yell and scream all the time. The kid I used to indulge when he did that because I've always been that way. She sighed. I haven't been a good friend of you, ain't you, eh? Oh, me, Jan, she cut in kindly, her shoulder gently bumping hers. You're a working wife and mother, she reminded fondly. You're incredibly busy, and goodness knows that I probably work more than I should, too, she added, her body releasing a little shrug. It's not as though either of us is running off having parties behind the other's back now, is it? She juggled. Not that I'd begrudge you for it, me, Jan. You've always been the social butterfly, and you deserve to have more time to yourself, you know? Watching as the other huffed those ruby eyes rolling, the blonde then wore an expression that she'd seen a handful of times. It was the look of a woman determined. It was the look of Bakugou Mitsuki preparing to enact a plan. It was a look she'd greatly missed these past few years. Okay, Incha, she stated, her strong left arm shooting out to capture her waist and hug her clothes as they walked. I have decided that we are officially out of excuses. She declared the sounds of their boys and their friends, squealing delighted as they sprinted up the empty cattle run that was usually filled with caring people. Uh oh, she grinned. Well, I lesson, the slightly older girl cut in, her free arm spanning out before them in an arc. You are young, you are gorgeous, and you are much too amazing to be just living for work. 
She told her, those beautiful eyes glittering. So we are going to start making plans just as we used to before we were married. She stated, her tone getting in volume. And hey, you don't want a date? Fine, I won't push anything. But now our boys have the normal neck We have a golden opportunity to begin our sassy womanly identities. You know? She pushed. You, you really mean it, Mean Chan. I, I'm not too uncool because of my felt anko. Blinking, the other's body having stopped, turned, and looking at her with a fierceness that almost made a breath catch, the shorter woman regarded her in wonder. Madaria Hiyashi is a son of a bitch, and someone who, should he ever come within a mile of you and I hear about it, will be faced with a very nasty, very traumatic accident, she said before the intensity of her look softening. You are amazing, Inchan. She reaffirmed, that brick didn't deserve you, and you are worth a million of him. Do you understand? She asked, both beautifully manicured nail hands now cupping her shoulders. You did not fail. You are not a failure. You are one of the most talented, thoughtful, and credible people I know, and you are beyond cool. All right? Feeling her eyes tear up, the emerald hair woman nodded her hands, clasped over her chest. Me, Chad, she breathed. I'd like to go out more with you, like we used to, you know? Ah, there's the ancient of a man there. The blonde grinned, both of them arguing. I just say to visiting our old sake bar next Saturday, hmm? I'd be willing to bet that Tanaka-kun might still go there, hmm? He was always sweet on you, wasn't he, hmm?